Good evening. Welcome to Octacon. Uh, this is the second of our two taster panels uh, that's happening before the big event uh, next week, which is all online, which is rather fun because we're all spending our lives on the internet these days, just on, on video feeds. It's very, very strange. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm very pleased. My name is Robert Simpson, and um, I'm here to moderate tonight's uh, Tester panel on cataloging the disposable. Now, without further ado, I'm going to get into the description. I'll introduce our panel. Um, I'll, I'll tell you who they are, and then they'll introduce themselves, and we're going to get underway. We're going to be here for about best part of an hour. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll read the description out again in case the guys haven't done it. Uh, so, which what fandom cherishes was inconsequential and ephemeral for its creators. Um, Pulp and children's entertainment were seen as disposable with no one expecting any lasting impact. From banned books to deleted episodes of favourite TV, fans have done the important work of archiving our culture. In this panel, the readers of the Dustbin of History share the secrets of preserving the treasures of yesterday for future fans. And I am joined tonight by our special guests, Michael Carroll, Rebecca O'Neill and Jack Fennell. Um, folks, I'm going to get you to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourselves. We'll start with Michael. Yeah, hi, I'm Michael Carroll. I, uh, I'm a writer. I'm... Um... I, I write books, I write comics, and things of that nature. And I'm um, one of only a tiny handful of people who has attended every single Octocon. And now that I've done this, I can just log off and not go to the rest because this counts as being there. No, I, I can't do that. But um, yeah, so uh, that's me, Michael Carroll, science fiction writer and such. Uh, let's go to Jack. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Jack Fennell. Uh, I'm an academic and an editor and writer uh, from Limerick. And uh, if you've heard my name before, it's probably been in connection with the Tram Press anthology, A Brilliant Void, uh, which was a collection of forgotten Irish short science fiction stories from yesteryear. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Rebecca O'Neill. I am project coordinator of Wikimedia Community Ireland, which is the representative of Wikipedia here in Ireland. Um, but I'm here more with my academic hat on and my, my nerdy hat on. Uh, my doctoral research was into citizen, what I call citizen curation. So people deciding to catalog and own like, niche areas of, of knowledge um, or of ephemera, that kind of thing, and how they integrate that knowledge into platforms such as Wikipedia. Very good. And um, I suppose I should let you know, I'm Robert Simpson. Um, so I'm a film historian and uh, I used to work for Hammer Films in their archive, um, amongst other things. So I have vast collections of stuff that's absolutely of no interest or use to anyone. Um, it is an addiction. And as you can see, the walls behind me are a bit like Michael, uh, crammed with stuff right now. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So look, first question, uh, I, I guess most of us collect something what was the first thing you collected uh jack the first thing i collected was asterix comics i you know was obsessed with asterix when i was a young fellow and then after that it moved on to star wars tie-in novels and you know it proliferated outwards from there so now i'm into old books old, old books kind of old books yeah I, I have a couple here if you'd like to see them uh, yeah, you can do, yeah. I mean, is this just yeah. any old book or is it old books? No, no, no. Generally? These these are uh, this kind of thing. I, I don't know if you can see that there. It's uh, a century of creepy stories. It's like one of these marvellous old anthologies that was published back in the day. I've got another one here, uh, Crimes, Creeps and Thrills. You know, they're published like up as far as like the 30th or 30s or 40s, you know, Kind of before that is where I, I I aim to collect. You know, I just I love them. Okay. Um, dare I ask, Michael, what do you collect? <laughs> what what um, was the, where did it start? What's the first thing that you started collecting? I, I it's hard to um, it's hard to know because I I was I'm very very old now and uh, time is time is but a misty murky memory. Um, I I can remember obsessively trying to collect the little free Doctor Who cards that came with Weetabix. Um, this is before your time. Doctor Who um, is about a time travel. No, you guys know that. Um, this would have been the Tom Baker era stuff. They were great. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing I was obsessed with as a little kid. Um, and then 
I moved into comics, or maybe it was around at the same time, I started realizing that comics weren't disposable and you could keep them and read them again. Uh, it was a great revelation. I was um, quite obsessed for a long time with the British Marvel reprints, uh, Spider-Man Comics Weekly, Mighty Water Marvel, and especially the Avengers, and then on. And, um, and then 2000 AD arrived in 1977. And that's, that basically changed the course of my life. Um, in, in, in many ways, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I have the uh, the first issue, 2000 AD, right here, still. Oh, ooh, ooh you may go ooh, everybody. Ooh. And here's the second issue. Um, <laughs> there's there's 2,201 issues out, so this is going to take a few minutes. But no, um, so yeah, second issue is the, uh, the first appearance of Judge Dredd. Ooh. So uh, yeah, 2000 AD became a huge obsession for me. Um, but other than that, um, I collected books by, by specific writers, and that's the kind of thing that uh, certain nerds in our community do. We find a writer, and then we have to collect every single thing that writer has written. Um, and that's, that it keeps me off the streets, you know. It's good fun. <laughs> Rebecca, I, you said that uh, you told us that you're more from an academic kind of perspective on this one, but you presumably you have collected something at some point. Oh, definitely. Uh, and this is when the, the, the oh, the, the mask really comes off. Uh, so first of all, I want to, somebody was asking, so this is Aineen, uh, Little Bird. Uh, this is, she's a puffin. She's um, the representative of the Irish group. There's an international group of Wikimedia Cuteness Association. Uh, so Aineen is our representative uh, in that, in the international uh plushies as they're referred to within the international community um but i think uh, like a lot of people of a certain age the first thing that i probably collected was my little pony uh, g1 my little pony and as my mother refers to them i still have my herd uh, <laughs> which uh, were transported from carlo to dublin uh, with great ceremony a few years ago so i still have all of those and all of my cindy's i was never a barbie girl i was always strangely Britishly aligned with the Cindy's, uh, the ones with the giant heads, not the ones that came later, I suppose. But um, I still have my whole herd and I have uh, at times added to it, the ones that I really, really wanted when I was uh, small and didn't quite have enough pocket money uh, to buy them. Uh, and then of course, things like Puppy in My Pocket, Kitty in My Pocket, Teddy in My Pocket. And what was, what was fantastic at the time, my mum did digs, uh, which was when students would stay with you uh, during the week, they'd go to Carlo IT or the VEC as it was at the time. And they just flew through boxes of Kellogg's. Uh, like none of us ever ate cornflakes, but because we had like three lads from Mayo uh, all eating us out of house and home for five days of the week, I got all of them really quickly. Uh, so unlike, you know, the Kinder Egg, you know, that was more difficult to wrestle the 50p out of my mom to get the, you know, the little turtle or the little uh, lions that you got out of those. So it was always much like, I suppose many, many little people around that time, many little kids, uh, miniatures and that has continued uh, I still own an awful lot of miniatures and anything small will always capture my, my imagination preferably one to six scale but I will go down to one to twelve if I absolutely have to oh dear uh, <laughs> I, just, I just love the fact that that's still continuing uh, I, I mean like I think about this myself when I, I thought about this question and I can't even quite remember where it is that I started collecting um, certainly, I mean, I also did Doctor Who things. So, Target novels were were a big thing when I was a kid. They were easily digestible. Um, it got me reading, and it was a way of exploring the TV series. Um, and I mean, like, I'm still keys and collecting Doctor Who stuff, but it sort of deviated into a lot of other places. I always felt that I was never able to complete a collection, which seems to me maybe is 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 that an important thing? Is it important to have a a, a definition for your collection and to have an achievable target? Um, Michael, I mean, you, you've collected every single uh, every single issue of 2008 and Judge yeah. and, and presumably that's never going to stop unless they, they cease that. Uh, yeah, Where do you draw I, the line? Uh, either I die or they die, and whoever survives <laughs> is the winner. Um, <laughs> yeah I, I that is a good question where where do you draw the line if if we're collecting um something like 2008 that's quite uh, and and it's spin-offs and one-offs and specials and so on it is quite achievable because I, I, I have achieved it but um if you were collecting something like the uh, the American DC comics that would be weird because how far back do you go and then you've got the problem of um of you say well okay well this certain company wasn't DC originally but it is now 
And I've seen collectors having this sort of dilemma. Oh, actually, I've seen, I recently had a chat with a guy who's a, a Marvel collector, uh, collected stuff from the 90s. And then eventually Marvel in the 90s took over, uh, they brought up Malibu Comics, who, who gave us things like Men in Black and so on. And this guy now has to collect all of the Malibu stuff from before Marvel. And so they're quite hard to get. So uh, I think completing a collection is, is tremendously satisfying because I remember the day I finally got my final issue 2008 that was missing. And I remember the day I got my, uh, the last uh, elusive Harry Harrison book when I was collecting all the novels. Um, and it's great. But then you're left with a sense of, uh, now what do I do? But luckily there's always more than one collection. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's other things. Um, that we can go for. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm uh, collecting, um, I suppose, well, actually, I haven't really changed. I'm still collecting comics obsessively, but um, just you just move on to different ones. I, I think um, if you do get to the end, yes, you get this little burst of, ah, that's done. And then there's a kind of, what do I do? Well, I suppose I could read them. No, 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 no I'm not going to read them. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, recently, as I'm, as I'm getting older now, because I'm, I'm, I'm in my um, very, very, very nearly in my mid-50s, I keep thinking, well, what, if I die, I mean, one day it might happen. If I die, what happens to my stuff? And assuming that um, my wife doesn't follow through on, on the, uh, the vow that we made, that we burn all my comics in the big funeral pyre, um, while my friends are watching, but chained back so they can't just keep the comics. <laughs> assuming this doesn't happen, What's gonna What's gonna happen with all my collection? Who's gonna love them the way I did? And I don't know if that's even important anymore. But I mean, I don't have two thousand and two hundred and whatever it is friends, so they can't all have like one each to remember me by. But maybe I should sign all my comics now, so they're worth something then. But yeah, it it is the collection is is um, and I don't know if you, everybody else would would agree with this. But then how would I know? I haven't asked. If we if the collections are just personal to us, their their only value is is um, subjective rather than objective. But if we collect something like um, oh, who was it who made the the Franklin Mint plates? Hmm. This was a big thing back in the it was it the late nineties, mid to late nineties, or maybe early nineties. They were there was these like, they have Star Trek plates or, or or whatever, and I knew people who collected them. So they have an intrinsic value beyond the uh, the subjective. So that's a different thing entirely. So, I mean, maybe uh, in, in your case, Robert, with your collection of, of strange hammer-related stuff, there would be collectors out there who would pay top dollar for them. So your collection becomes something more than just a personal thing then. Yes. I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, I'm in a weird situation. I inherited um, a whole batch of stuff off a friend a couple of years ago. Um, which has sort of supplemented my collection, but has also contributed to the problem where there's there's actually a lot more stuff now that I that I really need to deal with. I've, I've bits behind me, some of which are worth money to the right collector. Other bits, I mean, this little clock over here. This is how bad my obsession's got. Um, this is an alarm clock that was produced by the W. Hines Company. That's William Hines, who was Will Hammer, the guy who set up Hammer Films to begin with. He was also a jeweler. I collect the ephemera from his jewelry chain. That is how bad my kind of obsession has got, that I've kind of deviated way out beyond the horror films and all the other films and everything else into this this random stuff that is of interest to me and maybe two other people on the planet. Um, like So for me, that, that idea that your collection may reach an end, it's never going to happen. I'm, I'm always going to find something new. Um, I want to kind of on that note, I mean, I think um, Rebecca, when we're talking about sort of a lot of this stuff, this is this is media. A lot of the stuff that we're, we're we kind of we're acquiring is is stuff. It's ephemeral. It's not really meant to last forever. I know things have changed a little bit now, but why is it? You think? I mean, someone who studied this um, that that people are driven to preserve and collect because that's what we're doing essentially. We are not just assembling this stuff, but there's there's an element of preservation and collection. I, I looked at Michael's posts on his blog um, about his filing system for his comics. I mean, there, there's an obsessive detail that we go into with this. So where does that come from? Well, it's interesting because if you look at the uh, the academic corpus on why people collect, and fundamentally it's because they, they believe something is important. That's always uh, the overarching theme. And whether or not they share it with anybody else, that's generally 
um, there's kind of two forms. One is it's personal, um, I suppose, affection or uh, personal interest. So you collect something to, to read it or enjoy it or display it or, you know, just kind of consume it in your own way. Or you believe it has an importance outside of you. Um, and that's when you get more preservation. So people who might, you know, want to donate, say, a collection, they'll, they'll think about where it should go. Um, or when they finish a collection, they look for an institution to take it. Um, and that's where you'll find kind of like collections of ephemera say to do with uh, here in Ireland like 1916 uh, there was a very large uh, the Jackie Clark collection which actually didn't find an institutional home and set itself up by itself because it was kind of a, a coherent collection that was collected by one man alone so it's kind of split it up with seen as, as kind of um, devaluing it uh, if it had been broken up because you know certain institutions were like well we'll take this bit and this bit and we won't take that stuff and they they said no this is a coherent thing and um, so I think there's kind of there's there's personal and then there are people who believe that they're kind of doing something on behalf of everybody else and that can be very simple things um you know it could be and when you talk about ephemera like it could be you know the kind of people who collect, say, um, soap boxes or razor blade papers, that kind of thing. And they just believe that these are emblematic or matchbox covers. You know, they're emblematic of, say, the graphic design or the aesthetic or whatever it is of a time. So they, they, they tell you something about the, the time in which they were created. Um, and I think that's the fundamental thing. And I think one of the interesting things I think about collecting now is that um, previously, if you were a really niche collector, it was very difficult to find other people who you could share that with, whereas now, We've broken down most of, if you have access to the internet, we've broken down all the barriers. Uh, so the temporal and the geographic barriers that you might have. So like you were saying, Robert, you might be one of three people who's interested in uh, those clocks, but you can now, there's a chance that you'll find those other two people. Uh, and more importantly, you might find the stuff on eBay, you know, your, your ability to complete collections and to discover things, you know, absences in your collections. Those barriers are far lower now so it's it's a dangerous situation to be in because you can find you can always find infinite more things to collect whereas before you might have been blissfully unaware uh, of all these other things uh, but equally you you can have an exchange with people those really really niche people and i in my work refer to it as kind of like um the concept of the long tail so the long mm. tail is the economic concept so you have blockbusters at the top and then as you go down the long tail you get more and more niche and that's the same with, I think, um, interests. So now with the internet, you're far more likely to get things that are of interest to you and your most niche uh, interests, but you're more likely to find people as well. Mm. Uh, if, as I say, I'm sort of sitting there listening to some of those things that you suggest collecting. I mean, my, my Hammer collection does include things like toothpaste and... Um, all sorts of random stuff like that as well so like it, it is a it is a curse to have the internet now and to be able to find these things um jack do you have any thoughts on this as well and and also i mean as someone who, who works within an, an academic uh, environment yourself um i mean what about collections that are held by universities for research your thoughts on that and, and sort of the way that we access this stuff as well uh yeah i mean the, like collections held by universities are amazing resources but uh you know th there's a lot of politics involved in who gets their hands on someone's collection and uh and who doesn't want someone's collection you know it, it can be very kind of weirdly uh kind of backbitey like that but um every so often like i mean somebody will look into something incredible like a treasure trove of uh somebody's personal effects or somebody's uh library i think uh, there's a, um, a college in the states i think it might be notre dame i i can't quite be sure at the moment but uh, they actually got the contents of flan o'brien's bookshelves so it's not stuff that he wrote himself or anything like that it's just what he was reading at the time you know and they've preserved that i think they might even have the original shelves and you know researchers go in there to see exactly what he was reading when he was writing and that kind of thing um in ul we have a couple of uh, collections but none of them are kind of dedicated by genre or anything like that it's uh, normally what happens is you have like um a listed home like a stately home or a castle even uh, they decide that they want to offload a lot of the books that they have because they they need the space or maybe they don't have the wherewithal to maintain them so they donate them to a university and then you have to kind of go through them and see what it was that you got um in terms of dedicated well i presume that you know anyone tuning into this is going to want to know about sci-fi fantasy horror comics and that kind of thing um I don't know of any substantial uh, 
research collections being held in Europe or the UK or Ireland. Uh, the two major ones are both in California uh, at um, Riverside. And you go in there and like that is like the largest uh, research collection of science fiction and fantasy material on the planet. Although there is actually, I tell a lie, there is another uh, collection like that in Liverpool. Uh, the Liverpool University Library has a substantial collection. Um, so like, in terms of what do I think of them? I think they're great, obviously, although I'm, I'm biased. Well, <laughs> I think in that regard, I think university libraries are terrific. <laughs> it's fair enough. Um, as, as someone who used to work in a university archive, one of the frustrations I used to find was um, the fact that we can't always take you know when you're in an, an archive you can't always take everything that you get either there's yeah. a decision that's made and we're actually curating what people then have access to i mean is that a, that's a difficult thing to do isn't it jack well luckily i have never been in that position but i have heard the anguished screams from many a librarian yeah <laughs> um, you know they, they've come and they, they've seen this massive collection of wonderful irreplaceable books or what have you but for one reason or another we can't take it and like Rebecca was saying to split up somebody's personal collection is just the thought of it is abhorrent uh, so yeah that does happen with staggering regularity unfortunately I mean, there there is also a push, I think, within all sorts of collections to move towards the online environments, and more and more stuff is being made accessible. We've we've had the joy um, over the last over the lockdown, and the pandemic, of certain institutions actually opening up access to some of their electronic catalogs, which is is, is actually opened up a lot of people's eyes to what is out there. But for someone like yourself, Michael, who collects physical material. That, that actual physical ephemera is is there something about this that in particular specifically with comic books um that that pride that you feel within within that is that is that declining is, is digital distribution changing your relationship with your material you know how do you feel about this i i, I think it, yeah I, I i think it is different i don't know necessarily about comic books but i collect uh music as well by, by certain specific artists and the um there used to be this 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 buzz um where you'd you you'd, you'd track down a rare album or a rare single or something like that um and have the physical thing and you know it, it felt like um, an accomplishment to 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 get one of these things even if the accomplishment was finding it online and, and sending away money um it isn't a particularly you know uh exhausting um effort to do that but younger gen younger generations of people don't seem to value in, in my experience they don't seem to value the physical media the way that we did so if they want to hear a song it's on spotify or one of those things one of those internets and so they don't ever own a physical copy of the object now i'm not saying that they doesn't mean they don't have a collection that doesn't mean that their collection isn't worth the same thing but for me if i if i obsess about a band or something i will get the original albums even if i only play them once i can turn them into mp3 files i will still own the physical thing i don't have i don't have any music i think and i've got something like forty thousand albums um yeah easily um i don't have any that i don't own the original uh, album or cd for you know uh, I think, a bar from stuff that was only ever released digitally, if you know what I mean. Uh, so there's that, um, th the sense of collection is, is a bit different. For me, for example, when I tracked down, I finally tracked down the last uh, Alphaville single that I couldn't get anywhere in the world because it was only released in one country. It was, it was a struggle. That took like six months just to find someone who owned one, let alone would sell one. Um, but nowadays you can go online and get a digital copy of something for nothing. There's no scarcity. Hmm. Nothing in the digital realm is uh, is really scarce or unique anymore. And that's, again, not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different thing. So for me, um, I think there's essentially a great accomplishment in, in, in completing a collection or, or finding a, a, a rare item. Or, but there's also, and this is something that I don't think people will realize, there's also a tremendous uh, sense of satisfaction in helping someone else complete their collection. Uh, 
to pass something on to someone that you don't necessarily know that they they want they might want it um my friend james bacon for example um who's heavily involved in oxcon too of course is one of these guys who will ring you up out of the blue and say right you're collecting so and so aren't you okay i found one of them here do you want this and you go uh, yeah and next thing you know this thing arrives in the post and it's just there um I mean, I've been known to do that too, but no, I'm not as generous as, as he is. But uh, that's something that is, uh, it, it helps build a community and of course build friendships as well as, you know, you're, you're, um, you're sort of passing the, uh, the good on to someone else. For example, I just, as you mentioned, collect cash load all my 2000 ADs. I know where everything is now. It's all finally sorted after all these uh, years. And literally, finally, as in, in the past week, it's all got sorted. Uh, so I have got lots and lots and lots of duplicate copies of quite rare comics. I'm, they're not worth a fortune, but they'd be worth something to someone out there and I will, you know, pass them on. Not for mm -hmm. money, but just for, you know, for, for why not, that's why, you know. To, make, to, to create that nice warm glow inside. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and, and even if I don't ever get to meet the person who, who receives the thing, that's not what's important. What's important is that, you know, someone else's collection is that little bit step towards com completion and they're, um, they'll pass it on down the road as well, maybe. Um, I mean, one of the things that sort of strikes me as well about, about the sort of the shift to digital and the shift to online is that a lot of the importance lies in the actual physicality of objects. So for collectors, I think that possibly, you know, the thing that we want isn't the digital copy. I get quite annoyed whenever I miss out on an auction for some rare item well, rare to me, and um, all I'm left with is a couple of pictures of something that I never got to hold in my hands. Even yeah, if I, all yeah. I do is I stick it in a file and, you know, somewhere else and I never look at it again, I want to know that I've got that thing. Um, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued, uh, I'm sort of curious about how we feel about the the necessity to, to sort of preserve the originals, to document um, all the different variations that come within these things as well. Um, maybe Rebecca, you got to have some thoughts on about this, about, uh, you know, the importance of, of sort of that originality and, and the physicality. What you'll find is that there's, and, and other academics have looked into this, it's kind of, there's almost like different breeds or, or, or kind of a taxonomy of collectors. And some collectors will just want the reassurance that they, they, they own something. And yeah, the, it's not necessary that they're enjoying it every single day. They will put it within their collection. They're like, now I own that. Um, one really interesting example that I always think of uh, is a gentleman called Albert Bender and uh, his collection is in the National Museum of Ireland. And he was um, a Jewish man. He, he left Ireland, I think at around age 13 and moved to San Francisco and became a very successful insurance broker and was incredibly wealthy. And he collected um, Asian art an awful lot of very rare Buddhist uh, and other uh, Nepalese and, and uh, Chinese art. And a lot of it he never saw. He would just buy it and immediately it would just go into storage. But it was, he just kind of felt this, I suppose, it's almost like an encyclopedic or a taxonomic urge to own all these things. And what he did in the end is he donated all of it to the, the National Museum of Ireland in the name of his mother and a name, uh, a, a room within uh, Kildare Street, as it was at the time, was named in her honour and the collection was, was um, dedicated to her. So there, I suppose there's kind of different, there's a lot of different motivations. And I think the completionist thing or the kind of the, the, the Hoover effect as I kind of refer to it as sometimes, and you'll find Wikipedians that are like that, they'll just kind of Hoover up information. They'll be like, nope, taking that, taking that, taking that. And they don't really care. There might be an overarching theme to the kind of things that interest them, but they don't, you know, the minutia of it doesn't really interest them. Um, and there are different types then, of course, are the ones that are slightly more hoardery that they're like, they, they have the object, but they don't necessarily want to share it with anybody else. They mightn't, they mightn't create a digital copy of it, or they mightn't let anybody else know that they've, they've bought it. And so they'll keep it quiet. It's just personally for them. And then there are others that have that slightly more altruistic bent, where the idea is that they buy it and then they share it with the community that would have an interest in it, because they feel that the importance is not just significant to them, it's significant to a lot of people. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I suppose it depends on whether, who you feel it's important to, whether it's kind of a personal relationship that you have with the object and then the collection as a whole or whether it's something that you feel you're doing on behalf of a lot of people that are interested in the area mm -hmm. um, i'm sort of already starting to feed in some of the questions from from we're getting on on twitch here into this conversation as well um but in relation to that as well um we've been asked by antique eight on on twitch about is is collecting only valuable because of its scarcity um jack well um i i think that uh, rebecca and michael have kind of 
you know, said everything that comes to mind, really. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, the video nasties, uh, you know, era of the 1980s, where, um, you know, the, the censorship laws that were passed in the UK during that time, originally they were just supposed to target these, you know, exploitation movies that were made by three guys in their back garden over a weekend and then flogged out of a car boot on the Monday or what have you. And then they got applied to absolutely everything. And, you know, censorship laws like that, generally, um, what they do is, like what the Video Nasties uh, legislation did and what uh, liter literary censorship did here in uh, the Republic of Ireland, what they did was that they actually kind of increased the desirability of the banned stuff, you know? So, like, when somebody starts chanting, ban this sick filth, you know, the, the sick filth doesn't go away. It just it just becomes harder to find. And then there's more of a, there's more of a rush than when you actually find it. Um, but, I mean, again, to go back to Flan O'Brien, I mean, he tried, like, he tried valiantly to get a book banned here because that because then you'd know that you had arrived right you'd know that you were a, a real artist if you had something banned in ireland but um nothing he wrote ever got banned here which was a massive disappointment <laughs> disappointment to him and um in the uk then with the video nasties thing uh, when this list of banned films came out there were there were guys out there using it as a shopping list and then, like they were going around to like all these dodgy little video shops and going around to car boot sales and fairs and what I mean, like crossing things off the list just for the sake of doing it. Um, so I think in a certain respect, um, scarcity kind of makes something collectible just for the sake of it, um, regardless of whether it's any good or not. And um, yeah, I think it was Kim Newman was, he said once that, uh, you know, being able to find stuff on the internet now has taken some of the thrill out of finding that kind of thing. But, you know. Um, Sharon, I, I, Shara, I, I guess Janet, isn't it? Um, asks, says the ebooks uh, can also be scarcely due to them not being released globally. Uh, and what are the panel's white whales? Um, which I think is a fairly good question. Because um, obviously we're talking about the scarcity of, of, of ephemeral objects, about physical objects. But actually the reality is, is that even in the digital world, there is stuff that goes out on limited release. Either it's it's restricted by region or it's restricted by time, after which it just disappears into the ether. Unless you've managed to save it on a hard drive with, with, with software that is, able to keep on reading that in a few years time which is a, something I've, I've discovered recently myself I've, I've, I've revisited some some of the very few computer games that i've ever bought and um they're all like windows 95 windows 97 they won't play on my my normal my new kind of computer and i'm having to try and find someone who's, who's gone and done magic things with them uh i mean what do we feel about this what what are what are our white whales uh becca back to you so a white whale this is an interesting one, and I was thinking, like, God, I don't, I because I don't, I think I've bought one ebook, uh, and that was uh, that was uh, Adam Buxton's ebook that he brought out the last year, just because he he read it. I was like, I, I'll definitely listen to this that I'm happy with. But when you talk about computer games, and that's a really interesting um, uh, area to explore because you have the whole preservation versus emulation. Is it the same to play an emulated version of the game, or should you have the original console, the original computer that it came on, all the kit? And you had the full experience. That's something that a lot of uh, collections, so like the Science Museum in London and things like that, have thought about because they have collections of uh, video games and computers. And they're like, do we spend all the time trying to keep these things going and live? And the Bletchley Park Computer um, Museum as well think about this. Or should we just move to emulation because you get, you know, some of the experience of functionality, things like that. And, you know, those the two shall never meet probably. There's going to be people in both camps of that. The one computer that is definitely my white whale uh, is uh, a computer game called Black and White. Oh, yeah. In the early 2000s. Oh, yeah. God, Sim. Yeah. It's, it's just not out there. Um, I've got one. If it's up there on myself if yes. you want it. <laughs> I don't have my copy anymore and you won't get it unless I have, uh, you know, a circa, what, 2000 machine. It probably won't play. So nobody has nobody has created an emulation of it. Nobody has, has digitally copied it in that way. So there are, for a long time, I think the Earthworm Jim Sega game was the same. Uh, if you Google search for it, you just got nothing. You got like a kind of a Google whack, but somebody has since emulated it. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm putting it out there. If you want to- <laughs> Black and white. This is the sold out version, so it's not the original. 
You if see, you, this is the thing. It's not if you want it, it's yours. <laughs> this is where the collecting starts again. This is where it gets dangerous. <laughs> I mean, I've even got a serial number in there and everything. It's, yeah. I remember queuing up in Smith's for the, I think the expansion pack that came out of that. It was like 70, oh, yeah. 70 euro or something like that. And as a poor student, that was all of the money that I had. I don't think I ate or drank for the rest of that month. <laughs> Well, just let me know if you want it. It's yours. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Mike, Michael, you, you seem to have collected just about everything anyway, and you've reached the end of the level when it comes to your collecting. You know, well, end, yeah, end of the level, end of game. Are you going to do yeah. a hard reset? And, and what is yeah. your white wheel? Uh, well, uh, when I reach the age of uh, 54 and a half and a week and four days, which is tomorrow, I will uh, burn everything and start again. Yeah. No, um, I, I don't know. My, I don't really have any more white whales as such. Um, no, I suppose there's one or two things that I think, yeah, I really want that. Can I be bothered even to go as far as eBay to try and find one? Nah. Um, I, I uh, there, for example, there is a, uh, a, a CD single released by Alphabet a few years ago, which has a misprint on the cover. Um, and it's not a big deal, but it's the only thing I don't have by the band. Now, I've got the proper one that doesn't have the misprint, but I don't have the misprint. So do I go online and spend 300, 400 euros just for a CD single where the contents of the disc are the exact same as what I've already got? Or do I just go, yeah, let it go? Um, for something like that, I let it go. But if it was, a, um, if it was something that I couldn't get in any other form, um, then perhaps I, I would I would go for it. But at the moment, no. I mean, I've, I'm at this stage. Uh, at this stage, I, I'm thinking, yeah. If I spend money on this now, that's money I won't have for my retirement. But if I do spend money on it now, maybe it'll be worth more by the time I come to retire. <laughs> so you know, I don't ever want to get to the stage where I'm buying something, and this is big in the comic scene, where I'm buying a comic because it's valuable. Mm. Um, and I know there are people who, who do that, and, and even within the 2008 community, there's a lot of us who do that. Um, I want to buy, to, to own things because I want the thing, not because it completes the collection or because it's worth money or because it's conceivably worth money down the line. Um, back in the... I think it was 90s, well, I don't know, sometime in the 90s, uh, Marvel released a new Spider-Man title written and drawn by Tom McFarlane, which was, you know, it was, it was pretty good stuff. Uh, but when they released it, they had something like 10 or 12 different covers. Actually, no, it was the same image, but just different back colored backgrounds. One of them was silver, one was gold, some were red and blue or whatever. And I knew people who bought three or four of every cover, if they could get hold of them, mm. because they thought these are going to be worth the fortune. And then they ended up selling like, over a million copies, I don't know what the figure was. So now here we are uh, many years later, quarter of a century later, everybody's got at least one and they're not worth anything. Um, so they, they, they perceived value um, did not uh, pay, pay off in the end. But if you bought a copy of Spider-Man uh, written and drawn by Tom McFarlane because you were a fan of the character or a fan of the creator, you got the value there and then. And that's what's important to me. Um, I don't believe in slabbing the comics, which is basically where you put them in a plastic thing and seal them away forever, because in that way they, they retain their 9.0 uh, grading or any of that nonsense. Um, in Toy Story, that, that great parable of the modern times, we learned that toys are meant to be played with. And in comics and books are meant to be read. I mean, yes, we're not meant to use the books as, you know, serving plates for fried eggs or whatever. We're not meant to treat them badly. You don't use a book to mop up a spill um, unless you really hate the book. But you treat them with some sort of respect. But at the, if you don't enjoy the contents, then what you've got is a, is a bundle of paper or plastic, depending on what the medium is. It's, it might as well be waste paper or you know, yesterday's newspaper or something. It's, still not, it's not worth anything unless you um, enjoy the contents. That's just a, a notion. It, it, I'm 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 quite happy out with a, with a rule for life. I think as a collector, that makes me feel a little bit better about some things, especially like I'm I'm quite fond of I, I collect posters apart from all sorts of other ephemera, and I, I occasionally I sell posters and all the other poster collectors love this sort of pristine stuff. I love the fact that these posters have got pinholes because they've been stuck on a theater wall. They're yeah. used. They've got a life. Um, the you know. wabi, is it wabi sabi? I can't remember. Uh, it's a Japanese term for something that has used and feels like it's been loved. 
Yeah. Which shouldn't be pristine. Well, I mean, it can be pristine, but if they if they are, it's I great. Like if it not, it's better. It's a bit loved already. I'm going to love it some more. Jack, yeah. what's your white wheel? Uh, my white wheel, like, I'm, I suppose I'm lucky in that the things that I'm passionate, like old books and whatever, I mean, I don't have a definite end point in mind. Uh, but so like my white whale kind of changes, you know, semi-regularly or what have you. But at the moment, um, and for a while now, I've been looking for a novel published in 1896, um, it's listed in the uh, Rolf and Magda Labour's uh, list of uh, Irish fiction. And it was published in 1896. It's by, the, the author's name is given as Alfred Smythe, which could be a pseudonym or it could be his actual name, but it's called A New Faust. I have one of those, though. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, couldn't, uh, couldn't resist uh, it. <laughs> oh, God. My hopes. But, um, Are you okay, Jack? Can we continue? <laughs> yeah, we, can, we, we can. I'll, I'll cry later. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's like it's like exactly what it says on the tin, and it's probably not very good. But it's like a, an update of the Faust story. A guy he becomes uh, immortal by kind of electrifying his blood in true late nineteenth century scientific. <laughs> fashion and um you know it, it's just it was something that i've wanted to kind of include in my academic research for a while and just to kind of read for myself because it sounds like a bit of crack but uh i've looked everywhere and it just it doesn't seem to be readily available i mean i think there might be one copy in the british library mm. that you know you're allowed into if you wear a full hazmat suit and <laughs> kind of handle it gently with tongs and stuff so but you know, there might be something. It might be, it might be out there somewhere. This is the this is the joy I love about sort of actually looking for rare and unusual stuff. Though it's, I I mean I still get that thrill when I find something that I never thought I would. For example, I've got more stuff to show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talk about ephemera. I I, I for a long time uh, again tying with the hammer interest i've collected a lot of stuff but the guys that set up that company also ran a series a chain of cinemas called the blue holes and i always wanted to have something that came from a blue hole cinema because just like they ran in the 20s and the 30s and then they disappeared and i eventually managed to find i've got a few Ooh. of these now this is an original 1934 program but what i love is it's got a photograph of the cinema on the front of it this this when i find this i think i got that for a quid I was oh. so pleased. I was willing to pay like 50, 60 quid for this at the time. <laughs> it was just like lovely. But that, I mean, that's, that is literally the stuff that they throw away. It's there for a week, tells you what's on, and then it goes in the bin. The fact that that still survives, I think is fascinating. So this is where I love like with any of these sort of collections, there's the stuff that they market and they sell and they retail. But then there's the other interesting bits and pieces that make it up. So if it's a comic books, I can see the attraction in, actually, weirdly, I can see the attraction in sort of mock-up designs, in um, sort of original comic book art, in misprints. You know, if you're talking about books, I've got a few of those kind of Victorian novels myself that have taken me quite a while to find. Not none of the ones you're after. You can please know I haven't got those. I can't offer you them. Um, but, you know, th there is that joy. And then when you find it, it's that excitement. And, like, you know, you feel alive from it. Um we did say we'd do show and tell. Has everyone showed their stuff or have we still got our stuff for show and tell? Who's up for it? Uh, uh, Rebecca, let's go with you first. You seem very keen. I, th yes. I thought we'd do it. So for the folks who are just watching, um, you're more than welcome still to fire through your comments on Twitch. And you can also interact with us on Twitter after this because we're all on there um, and we're happy to chat to you. We're nice, normal people, mostly. Mm -hmm. Um mostly uh, but i thought one of the nice thing to do as well since this was the thing about collection is to actually show some ephemera we did a little bit maybe at the start but we're going to show something from our collections i think each uh, rebecca you go first so this is different from the one that i because I, could, I couldn't find my space fantasy cindy she is too deep in storage at the moment unfortunately uh for those of you who remember pedigree cindy there was a really cool 1985 pink haired space fantasy cindy it was kind of like a star trek cindy uh you know two of my overlapping interests but what i have yeah, see that. Does anybody else nice. remember Outfield uh, yep, Star Trek Next Generation Suites? I have one um, of those. Yep. 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 Unfortunately, incomplete. But uh, what I and you can see, yes, talking about pinholes. This was on my the front my bedroom door, uh, probably in around nineteen ninety three or something like that. Um, and I found a listing on Facebook. Somebody was selling a bunch of the unopened suites. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was actually able to. <laughs> I wasn't. I couldn't complete it. 
but I got most of it. So if anybody has any, any spare stickers, um, I am still in the market. I can list off on Twitter the ones that I'm missing. <laughs> there you go. We'll, Let we'll... me know. I've had sure of a few. Um, yeah, I, I don't have anything um, like, as, as cool as that, but it does uh, go back to it, 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 some ways to what Robert was saying, is that the, the bits around the edges are very, very, very collectible for certain people. Um, if you have like, f- like flyers for one-off gigs, uh, for example, are huge amongst uh, various you know collections of music. Uh, with comics, uh, I've got a couple of. Um, I actually I had them on my um, my my uh, comics blog uh, back in eighty two or three or it was sometime in the early eighties. I went to a Bimble House in London, and in the bag when I bought my comics, they stuffed in a couple of flyers for upcoming events, and one of which was a signing by Frank Miller. And comics fans, of course, this was, would remember this was when he was just starting off in Daredevil uh, before he became really famous. So the flyer itself is now, I wouldn't know if it's worth anything, but it's very, very collectible. So little bits like that I've got, but of course I don't have with me. But what I do have, a part of my show and tell, this is 2000 AD, the, the first of their summer specials, Summer special super comic, it's called. The, thereafter, they were always called the sci fi special. But this one has within its pages a, a feature on a movie called St- Star Wars. Never heard yeah. of it. Yeah. And any, this, any good? I don't know. I didn't go anywhere. Um, this was uh, the first physical, the first time I ever saw anything about Star Wars. So, you people don't remember, but there was a time before Star Wars existed. Um, and, and this, we looked at this as we were kids, we were blown away by how exciting this was because there's, uh, if you can see there, where's the camera? The C3PO, who is a robot. We wondered, was he a real robot? Did he make a real robot? Turns out, no. Um, there is a photo there of Luke Skywalker and one of his friends. <laughs> it's obviously Han Solo, but we didn't know that. Um, <laughs> and this was in two, so 2000 AD. Not only is it 2000 AD with Judge Dredd in and Dan Dare and all these exciting things, but Star Wars as well. I oh, mean, but on the back, speaking of collecting, look, space stamps. <gasps> and we haven't talked about the stamp collectors uh, amongst us. I have nearly um, four stamps, I think, at this stage. Uh, no, but there are stamp collecting is a great example of people using putting an, uh, uh, a subjective value rather than an intrinsic value. I think it's a fantastic uh, hobby to have. Philately, yeah. isn't that it? Yeah, exactly. Yes. What have you done for me, Philately? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see, now you've just reminded me. For a brief period when I was at primary school, um, sort of under 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 ten. I did collect stamps. I went to the stamp collecting club. I never had anything amazingly exciting, but I did have some stuff for a little while. So that was maybe the first, that thing was the first thing I consciously probably tried to to collect. Jack, have you got something uh, yes. for us? Uh, yeah, I showed a couple of these earlier. Uh, these are some old collections of horror stories. Uh, I don't know if you can see them there. There's a century of creepy stories, crimes, creeps and thrills, and great tales of terror and the supernatural. You know, a lot of kind of classic stories kind of got printed and reprinted in those, but uh, I I already showed them. So I wanted to quickly show some of the other stuff that I've come across. Um, Oh God. And this, this is mirrored and everything. So it looks even stranger, but it looks uh, fine to us. This is um, a printout from microfilm of an old newspaper uh, containing a, a short story called Chocht August Imacht Sean Vuille, or The Arrival and Departure of John Bull. And this was written by a 21 year old Flan O'Brien because, you know, he shows up in everything I talk about because he's like a ghost that haunts me. So, um, yeah, so this, this is like a printout of a microfilm that took me ages to track down. You can see, I don't know if you can see my notes there like I scribbled all over it in biro to translate the old weird type and the other thing uh, that I got which is probably the strangest um, artifact that I've collected from academic pursuits is this little guy uh, I don't know if you can see him there but uh, this is uh, a zombie Lego or a Lego zombie oh, yeah. uh, custom made for attendees at 
the UCD uh, zombie conference that was held a couple of years ago. Everybody got a unique Lego zombie. So, like, this guy has pride of place on my shelf. That is nice. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to play along as well. I've, since I've, I've showed you nothing but stuff all night. I, actually, one of my things has been sitting behind me the whole way through this. This is my big painting. Uh, I've got a number of these uh, from a 1984 episode of Hammer House of Mystery and Suspense. That's one of the original props from that, which I might be oh, getting nice. rid of, which is, is sort of a weird thing. The, the kind of the... The separation of the collection, the, the sort of changing it, the having to get rid of stuff for space and, and modify and reevaluate. So that, that's just been sitting there and I thought, has to go on camera at least once for something I'm doing. Um, but I had a dream weirdly about this thing last night. Um, so I, I'll show you this as well. This is another piece of ephemera. This is uh, an original. Nessie. Sorry, This is a poster for, for Nessie. Uh, which was a, a Hammer film that didn't get made in uh, about 1979. It was... Uh, uh, Produced, uh, was supposed to be produced at the time by um, David Frost, his, his parroting company with Hammer, and um, it's going to cost them $7 million, apparently. Uh, it just never got, got made. I've got a copy of the script of that somewhere as well. Um, but I love stuff like that, stuff for the things that actually never happened. Yeah, like I've got, yeah, yeah. Things were, <laughs> but they weren't. So I have a uh, collection of scripts for uh, Judge Dredd movies that they were never made. And stainless steel wrap movies that were never made, which is oh. quite interesting. <laughs> but I also have, guys, this is the Mighty Targ from 2000, the Alien Edge from 2000 AD. And there's, there was only a handful of these made. Um, Mickey was a very, very, very big hand that contained lots of these fellas. But um, yeah, he's, he's quite rare. And I'm probably going to part him soon because the leather on his is, because this is real clothes. This is not like pretend clothes like some action figures the leather on his his trousers is starting to fray a little bit which is weird but uh, yeah th these sort of things that you think oh i want that and then you get it and go well i've got it now what do i do with it and then <laughs> here we are now several years after thinking, yeah someone else might make better use of this but you know he's quite good because when i'm writing 2000 AD, i can put him on my monitor and he can glower at me as far as is one to do so i can i write better but that's the uh, trick I think you can marry condo these things. I think you can, as a collector, own something for a while and then you go, okay, I've yeah. owned it, I've had it, I've enjoyed it, and now I can. Oh, I've definitely just... done that with. with well, uh... goodbye. Yeah, collectibles over the years. I've owned certain Star Trek stuff and I'm like, eh, I don't want to dust this for the next 30 years. Yeah. You know, you just you, you either give it away or you, you sell it or whatever you do. Um, I actually completely forgot that, that you know stamps were, were and I, I was I'm very delighted that a friend of mine gave me um, some mythical creature stamps. <laughs> Ooh. I resurrected my childhood uh, stamp collection and uh, my brother's was incorporated into it as well. So I actually have, you know, special archival uh, stamp uh, albums. So if anybody hit me up on Twitter, uh, I will definitely take all, any and all stamps. Um, from a graphic design point of view and from um, how countries present themselves via stamps, that's how I find it really interesting. Like the, the, the version of a country that you'll see through their stamps is, is really fascinating to me. Um. Folks, I think that's us more or less at our time. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Aww. I want to carry on for like the next couple hours and we can nerd out in private. <laughs> um, so I, I think all that's left to say is, uh, I mean, thank you very much for, for our contributors, to Rebecca, to Michael and to Jack. For those of you guys who uh, fired through your comments on Twitch, uh, I didn't maybe get through absolutely everything, but hopefully we got through some of them, even if I haven't named you. And um, if you haven't had your question answered, just hit us up on, on Twitter or something and we'll, we'll kind of respond to you that way as well. Um, uh, I'm I'm sort of a last minute replacement as moderator for for Janet uh, Sullivan, who unfortunately is not very well at the moment. Uh, Janet, I wish you a speedy recovery. I hope things uh, are improving, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Uh, and thank you to Octacon for having us all. Um, it's actually been lovely. And uh, don't forget, folks, the big event itself uh, is running from the 9th to the 11th of October. Uh, you can find out all the information you need at octocon.com. That's O C T O C O N.com. Um, you'll find them all over social media as well. And there'll be other stuff going on on the Twitch over the next little while. So do tune into all the things, find all the different social media links, and stock us on all our public profiles, not on the private ones, because that's just weird. Unless you're going to make us a, a nice little offer for something. You know, I have an idea what we're interested in. We're all in the market for collecting something. And <laughs> um, see if you've got some of those things that we want, because we won't turn them down. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's that's a fair enough to say, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so everyone, thank you very much, and uh, we're we're, we're going to disappear off, and you guys are going to enjoy the rest of your time, and we'll we'll see you on the internet somewhere.